three, two, one. This is the Zorich podcast with a very special guest, actually, um, uh, part of the media, I guess. Um, yeah. which, but this is kind of fascinating for me because I've known him literally more than half of my life. Um, we have Tim Priester, the senior editor for Iris Illustrated, and the tables are going to be turned a little bit because he spent years and years interviewing me, but now I'm going to interview him. So, Tim, hold on one second. I'm going to play a little intro because we're so high tech. So hold on one second. All right, watch it out, Tim. We're big time. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man. <laughs> nice work. Nice Welcome, work. Tim. So Thanks, I, this is awesome, man. So so like I said before, I mean, this is kind of fun for me. And this guy, I can get, kind of get my shits and giggles here because uh, for such a long time, you know, in good times and bad times, you know, you were the one kind of prodding me with questions. So now I have a chance to kind of do the <laughs> same for you, which is pretty interesting because um, – those folks who, well, actually, can you just kind of give us a little summary of what um, Irish Illustrated is? Uh, well, I've been with, uh, I did I did not found Irish Illustrated. Uh, actually, Jack Freeman and Pete Sampson did. I was still okay. with Blue, Blue and Gold Illustrated, but I joined them, became a partner in 2005. So this is, I, I've been doing this for 15 years, and it's a, it's a website that... Uh, Man, if you want the minutia of Notre Dame football, no kidding. We 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 have got it. Anything that sticks against the wall, we throw it up there. I mean, but but folks, it is everything. I mean, anything you can think of, they actually cover, which which is fascinating. And I guess for me, it's kind of interesting because as a senior in high school, when I finally um, committed to Notre Dame. And I don't know if this was against NCAA rules or anything, but and I don't know if the 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 the, the football office paid for the 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 um, the subscriptions for Blue and Gold Illustrated, but this was a so I got mine in '87. So when did Blue and Gold Illustr uh, Blue and Gold Illustrated start? Well, it actually started. I was still in school when it began. Uh, it actually started as the generic name of the football report that was real brief that was before me and then it was go irish and the year i became editor was 1983 and that's when the name was changed to wait, to wait but, but you graduated in 82 right i became editor in 83 i was a pup i you know it was i was lucky the... i mean it's a i was in the right place at the right time and i didn't know what the heck i was doing but i knew what i wanted to do and that was to cover Notre Dame football it was a it, like it was, it was my dream to go to school there. I accomplished that. It was my which, dream. Which he did, folks. He's an '82 grad, and he actually played baseball too. I didn't know you were an athlete. Yeah, that was that was my second dream, and then the third one was to spend my life as a as a sports writer. And and it really, I was working for the South Bend Tribune part time in the summer of '82. I had just graduated, okay. and um, I got a phone call from a person saying, "Would you be interested in writing about Notre Dame football?" Um, and so. I was really, really fortunate, and it was the only thing that I really ever wanted to do. I've had some people say, well, you know, why didn't you go on to national publications? And maybe I was good enough to do that. Maybe I wasn't, but that's not what I – what I wanted to do was I wanted to cover Notre Dame football and Notre Dame sports in general. And so uh, for better or for worse, I'm in my 39th year doing it, Chris. 39th, folks. So so this, this, is, this is amazing because – so what I was alluding to before was, um, and I, I wish I had a copy of, of back in the day, but I don't. But what happened was when you committed to Notre Dame, um, part of the package that uh, you received was just Blue and Gold Illustrated. And I looked in it because I had no idea what it was, but literally it was the who, what, when, and where of Notre Dame football. 
And so as a, I guess, 18 year old kid who's still a senior in high school, like that was my go-to magazine. And then I think it came out like every, uh, every month. Did it come out every month or twice we, a month? Or We came out weekly after each game and then monthly the rest of the year. Okay. All right. So for me, a kid being re recruited by Notre Dame <laughs> and not getting it. And then what was cool was that they had like a little picture of me in there. So it's like, oh, I'm big time. I'm big time. But then you, I also got intimidated because they would also list everyone else that was going to Notre Dame at the time. So it, it, it was kind of scary because I remember like reading about Joe Allen and, and uh, Kent Graham, who eventually became my roommate. Um, you know, all these guys, Billy Hackett, Tim Ryan, Ricky Water. I mean, all these guys, I was learning about them before I got there. And so th th it's, it's interesting for me because not only do I have a chance to kind of interview the guy behind it, but I can kind of get some information on like, you know, why you got involved in everything. So let's kind of go back a little bit. Like, so you, you grew up in the South Bend area. Yeah, I grew up in South Bend. I went to Mishawaka Marion. I don't know if you had any teammates at the time that went I to Marion. I did not, no. Yeah, uh -uh. but Marion was uh, – I, I love that school. I still love that school to this day because I've always said if I don't go to Marion, I don't go to Notre Dame. I mean, that that paved the way for me because I got uh, such a great education there. So, sure. I, you know, I always felt like Marion was a con continuation to, to Notre Dame. And, uh, yeah, that was kind of – that was my dream. It was – I don't know whose dream it was bigger for myself or my mother because my mother, <laughs> my mother, my mother made a lot of sacrifice. Our family in general, my dad and my mom made a lot of sacrifices for me to get there. And then to, you know, I they didn't get back in that day. They gave out a total of two full baseball scholarships, and you had to be a pitcher or a catcher to get any of the money. Well, I was a middle. In, I was a middle infielder. I ended up playing third at Notre Dame. Okay. So we had to foot the bill, and I'm telling you, we were the we were the bluest of blue collar. I was the bluest of blue collars on that baseball wow. team. And the and the my son ended up being a double graduate in Notre Dame, and I was bound and determined. Uh, we were in a little bit better situation than financial situation, and my parents were back then. But I lived at home. I was a townie. I commuted wow. to Notre Dame, and that and that's no way to. The Notre Dame experience has to be sure, on campus, and sure. so uh, you, you know we were we, that was when my son was accepted Notre Dame. It's like, and there was no doubt about that. But I missed out on a, a lot of experiences. Had I not played baseball, you know, I would I just would have been a townie without any friends going to school. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, because that takes up so much your time. So let's talk about the baseball thing. So, um, I mean, when did you start playing baseball? Was that your sport? Did you ever get involved in basketball or football or anything, or just baseball? Yeah, I don't. I don't like to admit that I didn't play football, but that's the reality of it. I did. <laughs> but I, but look, look, I grew up in South Bend, and Notre Dame won national titles when I was six, thirteen, and seventeen. So uh, you know that was that was obviously very near and dear to me. Wow. I played I played basketball, Marion. I shot a lot. Uh, you know, I was I usually was like five for nineteen from the field, but but. <laughs> Baseball is uh, is what I excel at, and uh, and so that was, you know, that it was a dream to get to Notre Dame and, and play baseball. But I was uh, uh, I was the bluest of blue collars on that team. I can guarantee you that. That's amazing. So, what was your? Did you have um, kind of an experience? I mean, how good were you guys? On uh, actually, when you were there? Or? Yeah, actually, I, I actually transferred in my my sophomore year and. And uh, played third base my junior and senior year. And my, okay. when, my, when my senior class graduated, we were the winningest senior class in Notre Dame baseball history. Really? Yeah, but that that record didn't last long because Pat Murphy was right around the corner. Oh, yeah. Murphy, and, yeah, I remember and, him. And, you know, we would play like 35 to 38 games. And immediately with Murphy, I think the limit was 56. They, they you know, they, they bumped wow. it up. So we got, you know, our senior class was overwhelmed, but we went, uh, we were 29 and eight one year. We were 28 and 15 my That's senior awesome. year. So we were, yeah, we had the, we had the, we had the most career wins, our, our senior class and then single season, but those, those numbers uh, fell pretty quickly. Well, so, so, so how, I mean, I've talked to a ton of football players, but how was it, I mean, playing baseball for the Irish? I mean, was there a well, tradition I it was there, right? 
Well, I tell people if you're familiar with the campus now, the science building is where our our baseball died. Right, right, okay, right. And we had we had cinder block dugouts, of course, and I, you know, I thought it was, I thought it was Wrigley Field. I, sure. I mean, all I cared about was I was starting at third base, uh, and it said Notre Dame across my chest, and oh. and uh, and it, it was cool. I get a chill sometimes when I think about that because that was a. That was a goal. You know, I mean, you took your ability to the highest level on the highest level of football. The highest level that I was capable of achieving was college baseball. Sure, and, we sure, had, absolutely. and we had a good team. We had a, I had a tryout for the Detroit Tigers out of my, uh, or I'm sorry, the Cincinnati Reds in Detroit. Okay. Coming out of my senior year of high school. And my high school coach drove me. And, you know, we were optimistic and we, we had a, you know, a, a workout. I remember there were two guys in the, in the scrimmage that had two hits and I was one of them. Well, we drove home and I was certain that I was going to be drafted. Oh my and then God. the reality, then the reality of being a senior in high school and being like six foot one, 165. <laughs> with, with, <laughs> That's so good, huh? <laughs> with, no, with no strength training whatsoever. I mean, I was, a, oh my I was a shortstop. They converted me to third and I was a singles hitter. I wasn't exactly in high demand when it came to draft time. <laughs> but hey, I wore I wore the Notre Dame uniform. I wore it proudly. We had a lot of success, and that was good enough for me. I mean, but that's like so. So, do you remember like I mean, you know, going on away trips and stuff like that? I mean, riding that bus and and being able to kind of have that camaraderie, which I don't care what sport it is, and you know, it just so happens you're at Notre Dame, but. Having a chance to kind of be around those guys, I mean, do you keep in touch with those guys? I mean, what's what's the, you know, how's uh, that some, work? Some of them I do. I the left side of our infield was myself and and Ricky Christ, whose whose brother is Paul Christ, the head football coach oh, wow. at, at Wisconsin, and, yeah. and I tried to stay in touch with him. Actually, at that time, there were quite a few local players. Uh, our catcher was from Elkhart Memorial. Wow. He was great, Jim Montagano. Uh, our center fielder was from South Bend Clay. Our right fielder was from South Bend Adams. Nice. You know, so, so it had a real local flavor. But we had we had the best of the local players. And like I said, we won twenty eight games my my senior year. So we, you know, we we had some players. But uh, I was just happy to be, you know, to be a part of it um, and to have an opportunity to play. I I started every game my junior and senior year, except when I. Uh, argue at a ball and strike count in the first game of a double header. After I grounded out, I argued the ball and strike uh, and I was removed from the game and did not play the second game of the double header. Wow. And that was the only game I didn't start my junior and senior year. Cause I got a little mouthy with the umpire. Dude, that's awesome though, man. I mean, let's, let's see, this is something I didn't know. Right. And so the, the, the funny thing about when, you know, we have the media folks interviewing us, you know, literally, it's just kind of a talking head, right? And nine times out of ten, it's after practice, probably after a loss. We don't think very highly of you guys. No offense, and I'm sure you've, you've, you've seen that. But over totally the years, it. pardon me? I totally get it. <laughs> but but over the years, I think that we've we've become accustomed to each other. And, um, you know, there's there's some situations that we share in common. Um, good and bad, but the idea of kind of going behind the microphone, let's say. And so when when I told a couple of people I was going to do this, they kind of chuckled and was like, dude, you're like interviewing media people? I'm like, you don't understand, man. Like this guy, he's not like, you know, some some Joe or some, some guy, you know, from the Sun-Times or the Tribune here in Chicago. I mean, this is a guy that literally I talked to as a freshman in college, and I'm still talking to right. to this day. I mean, so, so for me, that that's that's something special. Well, we were. I mean, you know, back in the day, like I'm 60 now. So back, but back in the day, you and I were fairly close in age. So I like that. Sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I mean, we had it was a little bit easier to develop a relationship with you, and you know, we were we were considered a fan magazine, and I, you know, I I know that through the years you know, we, we cater to the Notre Dame fan, but we absolutely tell it like it is and tell it straight though, at least the way we see mm -hmm. the truth being. And so, um, I don't know. I think that that, I think you kind of respected that a little bit too, in addition to, 
uh, the friendship that 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 we developed. I mean, we weren't we didn't we weren't lobbing softball questions at at, right. at, at players. We right. were trying to analyze and evaluate the game, and and that was a, I wanted to be a I wanted to be a, a writer, sports writer, my whole life. But it was because I wanted to delve into why things happen, what the reality of it is. And so growing up in South Bend, being a Notre Dame football fan, and then writing for a Notre Dame football fan magazine newspaper, you know, that's what I wanted to do. But first and foremost, I wanted to be a journalist and I wanted to analyze it and break it down. And I've learned a lot, you know, I mean, in 39 years, I've obviously learned a lot uh, about the game. But having been an athlete, I think that I understood where you guys were coming from and what position you were. Right. And then also the pressure being at Notre Dame. I mean, right. You, know, you, you talked about, yeah, you know, you were. A did I tell you about my, did I tell you about my 2.12? Uh, uh, hey, great point hey, 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 that's what happens sometimes, you know? See my first semester of my uh, senior year. Yeah. I really, I was dazzling in the classroom. Wow. Well, it, and it's funny because see, and, and this is now, it's interesting because if we can get every reporter that interviews players with your background, then they might get a better understanding of what it's like to 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 to, to have to go out on the field every Saturday and play. I mean, being having to juggle academics, having the pressure in the classroom to succeed having the pressure to succeed in practice, maybe get a starting position. I mean, we're talking about start. I mean, there's only 11 positions on the, on the there's 22 positions on a football team, right? I mean, yeah. there's 105 guys in that locker room. I mean, some guys aren't playing. Yeah. You know, no, I knew, so, the, so I knew the struggle, man. I knew the academic athletic struggle. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, I absolutely lived it. And quite frankly, you know, I came into Notre Dame I went to my my first year. I got I got a baseball scholarship to Indiana Central in Indianapolis, which is now called the University of Indianapolis. Okay. And uh, uh, you know, I was smartest guy in the class there. Right. Then I reached my goal. I got into Notre Dame, <laughs> and then I walked into Uh-oh. the classroom. I, I, I was a I was an English major, and I'm in a class with twelve people. Well, that's not a lecture class. <laughs> that's there's no lecturing going on there. It's all yeah, twelve talk. people. It's all twelve people conversing and, and expressing their opinion about Shakespeare or whoever. And I am here to tell you, I quickly realized, uh, man, I'm in a little bit over my head. I better fight and scratch and claw. And sometimes I fought and scratched and clawed well, and other times. <laughs> Sure. Not not nearly as well, but I graduated uh, on time, and, and the, that's the, thing, the degree right? is still yeah. is over there. So well, as great. you can see, I, I I probably you know represent mine, but the idea of understanding that struggle in the classroom, and I'm not just talking about someone who's getting you know good grades or bad grades. I mean, whatever you do there, you. I mean, if you don't make the grade, you're out, obviously, right? I mean, we've seen that over the years. You've experienced it firsthand. I've experienced it firsthand, right? But folks don't understand that. And so you have this pressure to compete. And God forbid you went to public school like my ass did. I mean, it it was hard. I mean, my first semester, I was on academic probation, and they sent that note home. They gave me one. And I was like, mom, I'm ready to come home. And she was like, you're not going anywhere. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm going to come back home with you, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And she gave me this pep talk like, you know, hey, you're the first Zorch to ever go to college. Um, this is a great opportunity. You know, I'm not going to be here forever. You know, you're going to have to. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I want to come home, please. This is too hard. You know, but she sat in the head and kicked my butt. And I graduated, you know. But, but that's the idea of what Notre Dame is about. And because of your experiences, when a kid becomes academically ineligible and you guys are talking about it, well, guess what? You know, you have a better understanding than 99.9% of the people in that room that are trying to get a story about this kid. Yeah, but nobody ever publicized that I was academically, not, not, I wasn't academically ineligible, but had I been, sure, 
it wouldn't have been publicized. <laughs> everything, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Everything that's true. that you guys did <laughs> was under a microscope, and and most of the time I was the one holding the microscope. <laughs> well, but that's your job. That's your job, though. Okay, so when you, you mentioned the internship um, for, for the South Bend Tribune, I mean, when you talked about um, wanting to write about sports, I mean, did you major in journalism in, in school? Yeah, uh, Notre Dame didn't have a journalism major. I, they still don't. Uh, okay. And I chose to major in English, which, you know, like I said, I mean, there, there's no place to hide in the classroom right. there. Right. So, I mean, it was a great experience. You know what it's – I mean, I know you know what it's like to walk into a classroom in Notre Dame with fear in your heart. Absolutely. Did it every day almost. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's a great lesson, and you learn from it, and you mature from it. And then – you know, I have I have loved, I I love my job and I love my occupation. I always have. Now there are times when, you know, football seasons are long, and as much as you love your job, work is work, right? Sure. I mean, you were a professional football player. You love being a football player, but that was damn work every day. Absolutely. So, um, you know, so you can you you sometimes have a little bit of love hate relationship, especially now because, as a website, you know, you're open for business. 365, 24-7. And so, you know, fortunately, I'm surrounded by uh, some good people and I have a good staff. And so we, we find a way to, uh, uh, if one can't handle it at that moment, because, you know, you do have a life to live. Sure. Uh, and somebody else fills in. But we, we got a great group of guys and and uh, uh, it's it's been fun. I, 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 I truly do. I, I love it. The season is the season is long. Uh, night games are the bane of our existence, and Notre Dame plays a bunch of them. Uh, you know, night game on the road, work till four o'clock in the morning, sleep for two hours, get on plane, come back, and and rewatch the game and start all over again. See, it's but funny. Again, hold, on, hold on a second. No, no, no. This is funny because people don't understand that. Like, I mean, as a fan, they're like, "Oh, great! You know, it's a night game. You know, great. It's the only game in town. It's terrific." But what yeah, the, well, the, if, I could, if I could drink in the press box, I would probably be excited <laughs> about it too. <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing, and players hate night games, hate them because that's you got to spend the, the whole day thinking about that, right? Thinking about the game and everything. I mean, the the earlier the better. And then when we got into the when when I had a chance to to, to play in the NFL, Monday night games were the worst because they jacked your schedule up. And then, oh, all of a sudden, now you're playing on Monday, but then you still, you, you got to bounce back and play that game the following Sunday. With you, didn't have, you didn't have Thursday. Did you have Thursday no, games? No, no, you didn't no. have Thursday games. No. Well, here's a perfect example, right? So right now the Bears are playing, right? And they just played Sunday. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, how does that work? I mean, it's a short week. I don't know. You tell me, dude, because you're the one that had to experience going from week to week. Right now, now they're not playing this Saturday. Obviously, coming right, this, right. this Sunday but coming now, up. But now, but because of coronavirus, like there's there's a game tomorrow. A game got rescheduled tomorrow, or where I'm on the wrong days. Now the game got rescheduled for Tuesday of next week. Right, right. So it's just like they're they're. Pe I mean, this is a, this this is a this is an awful year for everybody. No matter what, well, you're yeah. To work and, here, and, and actually, later, I mean, I, I want to I want to segment it just to kind of talk about Notre Dame and kind of counting those issues and how you think they're doing. But, you know, when you look at the the NFL, you look at um, the game that was supposed to be played on Sunday, like the premier game was going to be Patrick Mahomes against Cam Newton. Cam Newton tests positive. Right. They move that game on Sunday to maybe either Monday or Tuesday. They moved it to Monday and then – it was on CBS, but then ESPN had their game on. I mean, dude, it was crazy. Like, you know, you want to be the only game in town for a reason, right? Right. So it's 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 amazing, but you know, somehow they're they're finding a way to do it, yeah. which I think is crazy. Yeah. Well, and and we in the media are the beneficiaries of the games that you play and the pain that you guys put yourselves through. I mean, <laughs> you know, and and you know what, Notre Dame fans. Now, I, I thought when I got into the business, the Notre Dame fans were crazy and. And you're right. You talked about receiving our newspaper and, and, and people say it all the time, man, when that paper came in the mail, it was, you know, it was like manna from heaven for them as a Notre Dame fan because you didn't have anything like that. 
You had the South Bend Tribune. Sure. Basically, when you were at practice and I was watching you practice, practices were open all the oh time. Oh, my God. Yeah, exactly. They are never open during this Ever. season. Now, Ever. It would be the representative from the South Bend Tribune and Blue and Gold Illustrated. Now, you were – were you smoking cigars back then? <laughs> yes. Okay, because I, I remember I, – I do remember you – on the sideline, and actually, Holmes was smoking pipes and stuff like that. And maybe you weren't on the sideline, but I remember you with your little pad with a cigar. Well, See, you have a weird random you thing I remember. I, well, okay, that was a yeah, because uh, Pritchett came over to the sideline <laughs> and grabs my lit cigar and goes back in, helmet on. <laughs> in the huddle and he's got it in his mouth and, oh my God. and and Barry Alvarez, you know, that look when, when you see something and you can't believe that it's possible, <laughs> that was the look on Barry Alvarez's face. Oh my gosh. You must've been out there unless you had already been kicked out of practice. I, I, I may have been kicked out of practice. I, <laughs> I may have, I, I, I may have. Cause I, I, I would say that started my cigar smoking career, but that, that wasn't necessarily the case. So you've now, realize that you want to do this for a living maybe i don't know and then you're approached by the guys at blue and gold saying you know hey how'd you like to do this i mean were you like i'm 22 like what the I, hell i i couldn't i couldn't believe it i couldn't believe my good fortune it was god god has been very very good to me my entire life and at, at, at age 22 uh, i actually i i worked that first year i was I, I wasn't an editor, and then the editor left after the '82 season. Oh my God. So in eight, so in eight to go to law to go to grad school. Okay. So in '83, I'm not even sure I'd turned 23 yet. <laughs> uh, you know, and and Chris, I mean, I don't even like to look at those old issues because they were designed <laughs> so horribly <laughs> that I that I'm embarrassed that my name was on them, but. Um, it, you know, I, I loved it. I, I started to go, I didn't go to every game right away, but I, st the F Holtz's first game was when I started a streak of nearly 400 that ended, uh, oh my it started in 86 and it ended in 2017 with a, with a, a, a bout of bad health. Uh, gotcha. but, um, wow. yeah, I mean, I, yeah, road games, uh, wow. home games. Yeah. It was like 392 in a row. It was, it was what? something I took. A, it was something I took a lot of, uh, a lot of pride in until, until, uh, my body broke down one, one, uh, no yeah, I could have answered. So, I mean, okay. Then I guess the other question is what don't you know about Notre Dame football? Oh, that's crazy. I mean, come on, seriously. The, hey, the guy, the guy that's remembered everything is Lou Simoji, who was my partner, Mm -hmm. uh, at, at blue and gold for 20 years, that dude forgets absolutely nothing. <laughs> Me, I, I write it down. And the reason that it's, that it's in, in typewritten print is so that I can look it up to remember it. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't, I, I, there are just, my, my mind doesn't work that way. There's just been too many games and too many players and too many situations and too many scores. <laughs> I don't. A lot of them. Uh, a lot of them kind of run together for me, man. Okay. So now, it, 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 okay. So now, literally, you are interviewing guys. Who actually, you've gone to school with your peers. I mean, so how how are you? I mean, are you taken seriously in the beginning, or you know, are guy? I mean, is Notre Dame <laughs> a different type of talent where they're you know guys are well? We we had West, but well, I would yeah. I wouldn't go away. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like, okay, I think, see, in the beginning, Notre Dame didn't want us to exist because it was an, it was an independent voice. Sure. And, and, and my voice was opinionated right from the very beginning, which is good. Well, it's good, but you know, I probably should have had a little bit uh, better knowledge base to be so opinionated. opinionated. <laughs> I was going to say cocky, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but so opinionated. So, I mean, there, it was a little, there was a battle with Notre Dame to begin with. Um, but then, as I've always said, they realized that I wasn't going to go away. And then Samoji joined me uh, two years after I became um, editor. Okay. And that was, he's, 
he's the greatest. He's the salt of the earth and, and, a, and a great guy. You know, like when you're talking about working until four o'clock in the morning and all that you have to go through during a season, you better be able to count on the guy that's next to you. And, um, and he, he was there. Um, so that, that was great. I, I, we were very, very fortunate to have him and he is still with blue and gold illustrated. Yes. Yes. I, I, I do um, know that. Well, well, here's the thing that was interesting. So there was, there's, there's no internet at this time. Um, Al Gore hadn't invented it yet. Right. Yeah. Um, but so literally folks are getting their information from this magazine that came out weekly. But then, I mean, I remember, I mean, you had subscriptions all over the country. There was a there was a time when we were sending out more than sixty thousand papers a week. Now we didn't have Whoa. we didn't have that many subscribers. Okay, we did not have that many subscribers, but but we were in the I want to say mid to upper thirty thousand, uh, which is really pretty incredible. Because you know the, I mean the market is so saturated now with with Nordic football information. Sure, sure. That it that it's there there are so many websites out there. It's hard to get people to pay for it because. So there's so much information out mm -hmm. there that do you really need to to pay for it? And, and mainly, you know this, Chris. I mean, what sells subscriptions today and for a long time now is recruiting. Right. That's what right. that's what you can charge for. Right. Uh, and we've got a we uh, Kevin Sinclair and Tom Loy handle the large the bulk of our recruiting stuff, and that's they right. are they are relentless. I do most of the film breakdown and and. Uh, analysis Sinclair does some of the analysis as well but those guys are relentless Tom Loy's relentless Sinclair works so hard that he you know he gets sick every few months because he's working so hard <laughs> um, so you know I mean it's it's a it's a labor of love and anybody that I think again there's so many websites out there now and South Bend Tribune I mean there, there's a lot of there's a lot of great people in the industry covering this this Nordic football program at a very high level. Sure. Sure. Well, it, it, and I'd like to say that, I mean, you know, you guys start that, right? I mean, I'm sure there were magazines like that. And I don't know if you modeled them after anybody, but I'm sure university of Texas may have had something. Yeah. I, I distinctly remember Kentucky. I think Kentucky, really? Kentucky well, basketball, Kentucky basketball. Right. Right. Uh, they were winning national titles regularly when I was uh -huh. a kid and growing up and stuff. So I, I specifically remember, uh, I think it was called the Cat's Paws. Okay. Uh, as as having the highest subscription total then, but Penn State having a paper. But they, you know, I mean, back in the early '80s, when when we when we joined the fray, there were probably I don't know a dozen, twenty such. Wow. Schools, you know, covering it. So that's why when Notre Dame saw it, it was like, whoa. Whoa, who are these guys, you know, right? Opining on Notre Dame football. Sure, sure, topic. sure. And, uh, and at that, I mean, did did Raj ever give you a call and say, hey, you well, can't that do would that? Be Raj, Raj, who I, I love dearly, and we 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 have come to grow uh close and extremely friendly. Uh, but it, it, it wasn't always that way because I mean he ruled he ruled Notre Dame Sports Info with an absolutely. iron fist. Absolutely he and, did. And, and and rightfully so, because uh, he deserved to. You sure. know, he was in a position to do that. But I think him and John Heisler finally just threw up their hands and said, <laughs> this SOB is not going to quit no matter right. what we do to him. And then, you know, I mean, uh, once, once Samoji joined me, I mean, we had a, we had a team going there and I think we were, we really started to put out some really quality football content and it's changed, Chris. I mean, you know, not having been a football player, people always say, well, Hey, talk more X's and O's. Well, you know, my background, I'm, I'm a, I'm a journalist. I'm a jock journalist is right. what it was. Uh, but, but a non-football player. So I've had to, Bob Kamel taught me a lot about okay. studying film. We started doing the, the, uh, the recruiting videos, uh, the, the VHS tapes. Oh my gosh. And I, you know, you, you learn a lot, uh, but you know, X's and O's that's, it's a, it's a very complex game that you guys play. Sure. And we do more of that now because we've learned more about the game, but you have to pick and choose spots because the vast majority of football fans don't want all that information right. or don't right. you know want to try to figure it out. But there's a segment that wants it. And um, if you're going to be good at what you do journalistically, you better do your due diligence and, and provide some of that content.
Well, so now is that on the the pay side of what you guys are doing? I mean, is that yeah, what you like, mentioned yeah. before? Yeah, stuff like that, like film reviews where you're evaluating a recruit or interviews with recruits or, um, you know, breaking news about what a recruit's going to do. Sure. That's basically what people pay for. I right. mean, I can, uh, we did it. We had interviews with uh, Braden Lindsay and Drew White and J Javon McKinley and Jonathan Doerr the other day. And, you know, there's 12, 15, I don't know how many news outlets are on there getting the exact same quotes. Well, you're, you're going to have to be, you're, you're, you're going to, you're not going to be able to differentiate yourself writing feature stories on those guys. Right. And so, right. you know, that's, that's free content to try to get people to come to you. And we're mm -hmm. heavily, we're heavily active on Facebook. Okay. We're, we're the free content. You know, we need, we need hits from, from Facebook and, right. uh, and we get a bunch, we, we, we get a bunch. That's awesome, man. Okay. So now when you were there, when, when, when we were both there, um, I distinctly remember practice being constantly open all the time. Yep. And I thought what, what some of the coolest things were, and this is when we, were, we started to roll and win some games, like the – and I kind of have – I'm kind of come down on, on, on both sides with this, but the RVs, they used to park anywhere. And so in the parking lot, what was crazy was our, our, um, our practice field was on one side and then you kind of had to walk, and you had to, you had to walk across the parking lot to go into the locker room. And literally, and, and that's a lot of times when guys would get interviewed. Yeah, we would and, we would walk off the we would be at practice, mm -hmm. and when practice and literally would end, we would and talk. literally walk right up to you and and talk to you and interview you all the way to the locker room. That's exactly. how, that stuff isn't happening. Today. No, that's not. Well, but and, and, and it's tough though, right? Because so I remember doing that, and I mean, I had my own issues with kind of being able to speak in public and talking in general. I, I had right. a severe stuttering problem when I was a freshman or when I was a kid, and it's so interesting because. And I would assume that the coaching staff knew this because I did talk to some of them. Now, granted, Holzer didn't come to my house or anything when he was recruiting me, but the the bomb kind of dropped when we were in mass one day. We, we were at an away game, and um, we would have a mass in one of the hotel rooms. Right. It wasn't required, but I went, and out of the blue, Holtz – you know, he he did he did a he read a verse and he gave it to me and said, "Hey, Chris, you read this one." Oh man! Now my biggest fear in the world would be speaking in front of somebody because I had a severe starting problem. So now you want me to read? Wow! And it literally maybe it was two sentences, but it seemed like a dictionary. I mean, it, and it took me about twenty minutes to get through damn three sentences anyway. And I remember Holtz looked, he looked stunned. And then I remember he said, come see me Monday. And I went to go see him Monday and he gave me the name um, of um, a woman by the name of Carolyn Weber who right. taught at St. Mary's and she helped me overcome my stutter. Now, I had no idea that, obviously that that was going to happen, but you know, I'm always indebted for, to coach Holtz for that, yeah, because he didn't have to do that. I right. mean, but boy, that was a time when we just didn't have a sensitivity to the end of, to the needs of individuals, you know. I exactly. Mean, uh, and so, God bless him for for having done that for you. Yeah, I, you know, I knew. I mean, you and I talked, and I knew that you, you know, you were battling that, mm -hmm. um, but you overcame it, and that had to be that had to be a a. a a feeling of tremendous accomplishment on your part. Well, but it's interesting because those are the, like, I mean, the way it's set up now, you know, if there's a severe, and, and again, this is so unique. I mean, if, if the kid stuttered, like right now, I think you only get like, uh, I mean, the coach chooses who speaks. 
right? I mean, even if that. And right. I, yeah. I don't think you would have had the opportunities because you had your selection of everybody. You could interview Reggie Ho. You can interview Wes Pritchett. You can interview, um, you know, a guy sitting on the bench. You know, hey, what's this guy's attitude? You know, how's this guy playing? You know, what do the coaches think about him? But I just think it's changed so much. And when you talk about having access to the players, I mean, you learn, right? And so I, oh, I started this story with the idea of, I remember this like it was yesterday. And I've always, always thought about this. My senior year, we were undefeated. And we lost against Stanford. Yeah. And we had the previous year, we only lost one game. And then my sophomore year, we won a national championship. So I thought my world was over, right? And I did not want to go out there and talk to the media. And so I was sitting in the locker room. I was waiting until you guys left. And Roger came, Roger Valdeseri, who was the sports information director for a thousand years in Notre Dame, came up to me and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I don't want to talk to them. I'm going to, I'm going to wait till they're gone. He's like, you don't want to talk to them. Why? I said, well, we lost. He's like, yeah, but you talked to them last week when you won, right? I'm like, well, yeah. He said, through regardless, win or loss, anytime, they, this is an opportunity. And he went on and on. And I was like, oh, my God, this is real. Like, this is real life. And he started talking about, you know, when, when things are bad, do you, do you fold? You know, what's the, and I was just like, well, and I felt so intimidated by Roger, who was like 4-2. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And I went out there and, you know, I talked, I answered questions and everything else, but I'll never forget that because that taught me so, so much yeah. because it wasn't necessarily about you, it wasn't necessarily about the team. It was about you have no problem talking when everything's great. But when things don't work out, are you going to go cower and, 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 and hide in the locker room like I did? I mean, it, it, was, it was an amazing experience. It was all about representing the University of Notre Dame the right way. Exactly. Lose, under any circumstances. No, he was a great, he's a great man, and, and that's part of the reason why he's a great man. Now, today... If you didn't want to talk to the media, Chris, you wouldn't have talked to the media, and that's just that's just that's just the way it is. But I believe in that, and and I, there's a lot of younger people uh, that I work with that roll their eyes every time I bring up Roger Valdez's name, and usually it's with in regard to that, Chris. That hey, good times or bad, you got to face the music because you know what? That's that's life. That's adulthood. That's that's being accountable. I, it's my, exactly. I coached high school baseball for nine years and I would always tell the parents the, the, the one thing that I can teach your, your sons that is the most valuable of all is accountability. And that, exactly. that's what, that's what that's all about. Good times or bad, uh, bad times own it. You did it. You contributed to it. I don't. I mean, I don't know that. I don't know that you. No, no. Believe I did because I remember Tommy Bardell running across my chest, and I was on the ground going, <laughs> he had "Son a good, of a bitch!" He I did for like twice on me. <laughs> Unfortunately, I remember it like it was yesterday. No, but that, to me, that, that, that's Notre Dame, Chris. I mean, that's the value of the University of Notre Dame, and that's why uh, I will but, 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 swear but, but, by it going to my, my grave. Question. Here's my question. But you, you can do that. I mean, as as a, and I'm not talking about Brian Kelly, but as a coach. You can teach that that accountability, right? I mean, you can teach yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's it's a powerful feeling when you're a coach, and that's another thing people roll their eyes out at when I when I bring up my coaching experiences. But I, it it helps me in my everyday life. It was one of the reasons why Charlie Weiss and I got along so well. One, I was a Notre Dame graduate like him, and two, mm -hmm. I was a coach, and I could relate on a much lower scale, of course, but <laughs> right. I could relate to. I could relate to the issues of dealing with your players. And, you know, I was always, Bob Davey always told me, if you think that, uh, if you think that when you get to college that the parents don't complain about their son's playing time, you're badly mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they, certainly do, they, they certainly do that on a high school level. But uh, no, I cherish that opportunity to coach high school kids at my high school alma mater. Mm. The only wow. place where I really wanted to coach high school baseball, 
Uh, and it's a, it's a powerful opportunity. Now, I sat down with Coach Holtz about seven years ago, and he said to me, you know, this is interesting. I don't think I told you this. He said, man, I wish I would have done things a little bit differently. Man, I wish I would have treated really? the players. A, yes. I wish I would have treated the players differently. Well, um, I was fortunate enough to be inducted to my high school's Hall of Fame. Uh, Congratulations. Nice. And that was that was one of the things that I said. And I had a few players there. It's like, man, I wish I would have mm. done things a little bit differently. But, you know, when you're in the heat of the moment, I, I was a I was a hothead coach. I was a hothead player. Mm -hmm. So are you. Uh, and I was a hot head coach and it's hard to just turn that on and right. off if that, right. and that's why I have great respect for Brian Kelly because Brian Kelly changed, yes, changed yes. himself after the 2016 season. Yes. And for the life of me, I don't know how you can do that. I'm just probably I was, yoga or something like that. I, you know, I, I, something, that. Right? I was wired one <laughs> way and it was, and I wish I would have dealt with my players differently, except sure. that this was always the overriding thought. If I let them relax, they're going to let down. And that was Holtz, right? He never yeah, exactly. And, and, and here's the thing. And, and speaking on that, well, you know what, here, give me give me two seconds. I'm, I'm going to play my little commercial here. And then we're going to get back. To, on, 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 on the flip side, I'm going to talk about, like, kind of that commitment that's being successful and kind of not smelling the roses as you're going through it. So give me two seconds. I'm going to play a little small little commercial. See how about that, man? You know, and then who knows? I just happen to have a little little bottle in the back. You know, there it is. I see it. Who knew, right? Who knew? If you sent me a couple of those bottles, I'll put it in the background too. It sounds great. I, I, I will think about doing that next time. Okay. So, when you talk about kind of not some on the roses, and, and, and this is something that you know, I talked to Coach Holtz about. And he he didn't share that with me. What what he shared with you, but. I didn't realize how good we were because honestly, I thought we were going to win every game. And so, but that was the, that was the mentality that he instilled in us. Right. So the idea that we approached a game like Navy, the exact same way we approached Michigan. I mean, I'm sure you've heard his BS stories about how great, Navy is and how great Air Force is and everything else. Rice. I remember Rice in particular. There you go. Right, right there. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's talking about Rice. They literally had not won a game in like the last 20 years before he played him or something like that. <laughs> but, but you know, I remember, and actually, I mean, this is true. They had a center named Courtney Hall who he's played in NFL who yeah. beat the crap out of me. Really? I think I only made like two tackles or something like that game, but he was really, really good. And, I mean, he actually, since then – um, he, he, he played for San Diego, played in NFL for a little bit, like went to law school, got like his MBA at like University of Chicago. He's like a brilliant, like, like a Mensa guy or something like that. But, you know, it's so interesting because that's how I think the way you coached is the way I think I coach, right? Because it was always have to give 100%, have to practice hard, have to do everything hard because if you let up, then that's when – the adversity could set in, right? I mean, well, that's when kids don't pay attention. Complacency is is the worst thing that can happen to a young athlete. And we, you know, I mean, when you're dealing with fifteen to twenty three year olds, I mean, it's just it's human nature. It, 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 I don't even know if it's an age thing. I think it's a human nature. Now, when you're a professional and you're getting paid to do it, right? And, that's and a poor right. 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 It's it's a different situation. But I was always concerned about my players being complacent and that was Holtz. I mean, Holtz, he couldn't stand the thought of you guys 
thinking, I mean, he want, well, you know how he, he would tear you down at the beginning of the week and build you up for the game. And you believed it. And I don't know how he did that. I mean, every I week. Mean, <laughs> I, you know, I wasn't tearing guys down all the time, but you, you always want, you could always sense when, okay, we're losing our focus. Okay. We're not getting accomplished what we need to get accomplished. And then on the level that you guys played and the complexity of the, the game of football, I mean, I, I can't even imagine all the things that a head coach and the, the assistant coaches have to be responsible for. So I totally, I, I said to him, coach, when he said, boy, I wish I'd handled things a little different. I, I was like, coach, I God, I get it, man. I understand completely. And I'm thankful that you were the way that you were. <laughs> well, you know, and that's the thing, Tim, because, you know, we don't know what the flip side of that is, right? We don't know what a a non um, uh, 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 excited, non pressurized situation that Holtz put us in. Well, we don't know what that, that alternative may have been, right? And so I only say that to say that, I mean, that also prepared us for life, right? And Absolutely. so when, when, when you're teaching these high school kids the same way that, that, that Coach Holtz taught us, I mean, you're preparing them for life. And Absolutely. As a coach for nine years, I'm sure there were some stupid things you did, but the, the, the positives hopefully far outshine, you know, those little bonehead moves because, you know, at the end of the day, and this is, I strongly like if, if, if every kid in America could just play, get involved in any sport and mainly team sports. Right. And, and I'm not going to, I mean, I'm not going to knock tennis or anything like that. It's a great sport. But when you have to depend on that person next to you, it's a whole different ballgame. I mean, you learn, and a lot of people equate um, athletics to like being in, in the military because like you don't choose who you're in that foxhole with, just like I didn't choose who I lined up against, but we made it work somehow. Yeah. And I think that assists a young person in dealing with their everyday relationship. Yeah, that, that's accountability. And I want to bring Dalen Hayes, uh, current Notre Dame captain and defensive end. Um, he talked about how accountable their team is and, and accountability not being, it doesn't have, it's not the coach saying, hey, you need to do this. Right. It's a player saying to a fellow teammate, no, you can't do that. You've got to do, you've got to do this. Mm -hmm. You've got to do it like, you know, the right way. When you're accountable for your teammates, now you got something. And that right. goes a long way towards explaining 35 and six in the last 41 games under Brian Kelly. I, I, oh, absolutely. I, I truly believe that people laugh about, he talks about traits all the time, man. It's an emphasis of those traits. That's why you're 35 and six. People don't want to hear it because they don't want to believe it. And it's just, it's like this game this weekend, Florida state sucks and Notre Dame should destroy them. And then if Notre Dame doesn't destroy them, then Notre Dame sucks. Right. Well, it, it, it doesn't right. always it doesn't always work that way. Notre Dame should win this weekend, you know, but they haven't played in three weeks either, and they had twenty five guys in isolation. <laughs> right, right. Ten, ten right. days ago, so <laughs> you know, but that will all be forgotten if it's, you know, if it's twenty to fourteen in the third quarter this week. And it, sure. it, but the reality is, it's hard to it, you don't you, in, unless you're a player or a coach. On a, on a high level, you don't know how hard it is to win. You don't know how hard it is to win game after game after game. That's why what you guys accomplished, 17-game winning streak, 23-game winning streak from 88 through 93 was, you know, I mean, six years of, of it was a good good time to be covering Notre Dame football. There. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Uh, you know, but, I mean, to, to do that and to play it at, at that level, you better have the right traits that Brian Kelly talks about, and you better be accountable for your teammates. Otherwise, you're going to be and, – and look, during all of your success, you had a lot of close wins, but you prevailed in most of those because of right. all the things that, that we're talking about here. Right. So, was, so as a journalist, I mean, how do you convey that? How do you – I mean, how do you put that um, – I mean, I'm going to say paper because I'm 51, but I mean, how do you convey that to your listeners, to your, your readers and say, Hey, this isn't easy. I mean, being a, I'm not even talking, being a division one athlete as you were period is hard. 
So the fact that you're coming down and you say this 18 year old, the sophomore sucks. Like how dare, you know, I, I, I want to punch somebody in the face when they, they criticize these players like that because they have no idea how hard it is just to be a division one athlete. Now you throw in, Oh, you're at Notre Dame and Oh, you got to succeed in the classroom and the field. I mean, how do you express that to your, your listeners? Just the way I your readers? It. just the way I said it a minute ago. I mean, I try to, I, I try to, uh, I try to write the message that I speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I mean, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it's more eloquent than other times. <laughs> sometimes the situation on the field dictates, um, you know, how good you're going to be that day. Cause some, some stories from games are better to tell than others. Uh, but I really think, you know, I mean, being around you guys and having grown up as an athlete and then having experienced things as a, as a high school coach on a, a we, we played in two state championship games. So we played nice. on it. All right. We, played on it. we lost them both, but we played. Hey, in two you got there. Uh, and we played, you know, at a high level. And um, I think it's all contributed to my development as a, as a writer. And you say, how do I write it? Just the way I said it. If See, I get, it, yeah. And that's because you played, that's because you experienced it. I think, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you, you know, how you, how you write and everything, but I think that, I mean, having that experience in being able to write, being able to kind of, when a kid says something and you nod and go, I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, a lot of people can't say that, right? I mean, a, a lot of people can't, don't understand what it is to be having to, to study at, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning knowing that you may not pass this class or this test. And oh, by the way, that may determine if you're going to be eligible, you may lose your scholarship or you, you, you may not play that week. Yeah. I mean, these are real things that folks don't understand. And, you know, unfortunately now in our society, people who follow college football, they think it's a professional sport. And that's unfortunate because although they can look at it on TV on Saturdays, these are kids. These are kids that are going to class. These are kids that have problems at home. They have to deal with all that. They do, and we all know that being a Notre Dame football player is tougher than it is at a lot of state schools. And that's not – that doesn't mean that, that there aren't good educations right. to be had. Right, right. Uh, but a, a lot of times, depending upon your major, you know, you choose – you can choose a very, very difficult right. path right. getting right. through Notre Dame. You can choose an easier path. Uh, you know, that there, there's truth to that as well. But, you know, I was going to say, Chris, when, when I was playing baseball in Notre Dame, we would play double headers on weekdays. So like a lot of times at a lot of times, like at noon, I was done for the day. I mean, we missed, you know, there was always about how many classes do Notre Dame football players miss? I guarantee you the baseball team baseball missed way more classes yeah, baseball is insane. during the week. Now they don't play double headers. If they play double headers now, they start at six o'clock. Yeah. They usually, I, they don't, I, I think double headers are usually reserved for conference play on the weekends. Mm -hmm. but we played them during the week, which is just, which is insane. They don't do that anymore. Fortunately. Uh, because guys like me could not afford to make all that. <laughs> well, the the NSA stepped in and like, you know what? I don't think we're giving these guys yeah. a chance. You can't yeah. finish a game at eleven o'clock at night and expect them to do homework and well, quick we them, start, like we'd start at you know early afternoon. Oh my god. Double header weekday. Yeah, it Jeez. was it was it, it was crazy. But uh, you know we <laughs> We didn't experience any, any of the pressure that you guys were under. I mean, self-inflicted, self Holtz inflicted, sure. media inflicted, fan inflicted. Uh, yeah, there are times and you know, who am I to tell a fan that they take this too seriously when I've devoted my entire right. life <laughs> covering what you do? But we, but but yeah, there are certainly times when you know it's like, all right, hold on, man, you know. It, it, it's it's human beings and the other team to use the old phrase gives out scholarships too. Right. And, and even, even when you are the better football team or whatever team that day, that doesn't guarantee anything, which is why Holtz was the way he was and making sure that you had no complacency and 
other old school coaches have done, you know, the same thing. You can't coach. You can't be old school anymore. You know, that. I, I can't even imagine how it's like being a coach now. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that that's bad because old school coaches took it too far. I, I include, I include myself in that at times, but, um, you know, we've gone a long way in the other direction. It used to be, it used to be team first, player second. Right. And now, oh my God. And now, now, oh. now. Well, it's and then first. literally, I think it happened when whoever came up with the idea of giving everybody a participation trophy needs to be assassinated. Because, <laughs> and, and, and if you did that to your kids, I apologize. However, it doesn't sound like you did it. So, but I, I coach little league, so I did it then. Okay, no, okay, I didn't, right. I didn't okay. Do that. Well, well, when they're five and six, I'm fine. Yeah. But like when 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 you start getting older and realize like you know loss and um, uh, uh, you know what do you do with success? I mean, uh, a, a participation trophy doesn't help. I mean, it just it, it makes you say, oh well, even though I can't. Part- I mean, whatever happened to first, second, and third? If you're fourth, work harder. Yeah, it just doesn't work that way now, Chris. It just doesn't. Well, I know. I mean, and that's the reason why I I coach for – so people have asked me for years, Chris, why don't you coach, why don't you coach? And I knew that I couldn't coach because if that kid wasn't giving 100%, like, like I don't know how not to give 100%. Now, maybe, this is my idea. Maybe that's my fault, but I don't know how not to. And so if a kid doesn't do it, I'm either going to try to kick his ass or I'm going to get fired. And we're well, talking about an 18-year-old kid. So I, uh, you know, I'd be I, mean, I experienced I, – I had a kid that I, I always joked that you could wake him up at 3.30 in the morning, put a bat in his hand and step it and put him in a batter's box and he, he'd hit a line drive. But coaching that kid mm. was uh, – and if any of my former players are, are listening, they, they'll know who I'm talking about. But he, he was a great player, but he wasn't going to conform. Oh, so I, there were times when, you know, what, what was I going to do? Not play the kid that was my best hitter in our second state title run. So oh. you find yourself compromising, getting very upset, which I was apt to do in those situations. Uh, and, and I did Holtz ever compromise. I, I, I don't, I mean, I think when he, I think there were moments when he had to, Sure, sure. But but sure. he would probably make up for it down the road after that. Well, yeah, well, I guarantee he lied to us. I mean, and I say that because I remember vividly my first game I was ever going to play. It was against Michigan. This was 88. Right. And I was terrified. And he called me his office and said, hey, the center has been talking a lot of crap about you in the media. <laughs> And I'm like, huh, what, 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 really? What's, you know, and he's going on, he's saying, you know, he's never heard of you before, you know, who's this kid? And he's from Chicago. What? And I'm sitting there like, I'm fuming. And I think it's like maybe Thursday or something like that. No, I think it was, it was a, it was a, a, a contact day. And I remember going on, I, I like killed whoever I lined up against that day because I was so pissed. But he knew that that's what would get me motivated. And then during the game, I'm like talking smack. I'm like, yeah, we see what you did. And he's like, dude, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, what, 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 what do you mean? And he's like, who are you? Well, I'm like, what? You know, so. He never, okay, now he never said this. To, I doubt that he said this to you, but I can I can name 12 former Notre Dame players that told me that he did this to them. He'd call them into the office and say, you know, tell me who you want me to call. I'll I'll facilitate a transfer for you. And the player would be like, coach, what are you talking about? Well, you know, it's obvious that you're not going to give me a hundred percent and I'm more than willing to let you out of your scholarship here. Just tell me who you want me to call and I, and I'll call them and I'll, oh, yeah. I'll make it happen. And then naturally the player uh, easily gives a hundred percent. Right. From that point right, forward. right. Oh yeah. But, but and it worked for him, you know, and, and, and that's, what's amazing. And that's what I was talking about. Like, I don't know if, and, and again, I, I think it's hard. Kind of what we're talking about before. I mean, how do you let up and let kids smell the roses, but being in this high pressure environment and have us win, right? I mean, if he's playing psychological mind games with us individually, 
and as a team, you know, you're telling us that we're going to lose the Navy. But how do you how do you smell the roses during that? Well, I don't, I, and maybe you can fill me in how he handled this. What I tried to do was, for every harsh comment that I had, I tried to find the positives. I mean, you have to re you, there has to be positive reinforcement. Right, reinforcement, right? And so I don't know how many of my players remembered all the positive things that I said <laughs> because they tended to cling to the negative things. Sure. But I think that if you if you recognize success and and give them plaudits for achievement, I think you can you can go a long way towards striking a balance. And so then when you're critical, uh, the player knows that hey, if I do something right, right. he's going to recognize it. Right. And if I do something wrong, he's really going to recognize yeah. it. Yeah. You know, and now that I think about it, I mean, I think that that's some of what Holtz did as well. Um, all right, so we're going to transition a little bit from from Holtz's deal, but the, I mean, how you've interviewed hundreds of players, thousands, man, thousands. I'm gonna be, I'm, I'm gonna to my own horn here. Outside of me, just because you're on my show, outside of me, do you have a favorite, or maybe not a favorite person, but do do you have like a, a memorable story that you could share kind of about the, about a person that you well, interviewed. Yeah. I mean the, the, the best one, and it's been told too many times and a lot of people are tired of hearing about, but the best one was the cigar with Pritchett. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I actually did an event with Pritchett in Atlanta. Okay. Along, along with like nine other Nordane players. And we, 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 between him and me telling the story live, it was, it was, it was uh, received pretty well. Let's put That's it that That's awesome. I, you know, I mean, Look, I, I've covered Notre Dame for 39 years. I've 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 interacted with a lot of sharp dudes. There's no doubt about that's that. That's what I was gonna say. I mean, you know, you'd have to go back, like like eons. I mean, how do you remember even remember? Yeah, all those I mean, I just from your era, you know, I, I mean, you and I always had a great relationship. The the three amigos with Pritchett and Stams and and Stonebreaker was, I mean, it was kind of like the Three Stooges sometimes. Sure. Uh, Stoney being the, the, the quiet one <laughs> um, and, you know, Stams and Stams and Pritchett being a little bit more outgoing. Ned Bolkar and I uh, continue to have a, have a great relationship. I don't know. I'm, I'm often amazed. I think all of us that cover Notre Dame now are often amazed at. Uh, okay. I'll give you an example from uh, yesterday, yesterday, two days ago. Okay. We're interviewing Javon McKinley and he, he took, he took Chinese because he thought that that would be a good thing to learn and maybe something he could apply after his football playing days are over. Jeez. Chris, did you take Chinese? I, I did not take Chinese. I, 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 <laughs> I don't know if they offered it back back then, but had they offered it, I would have had a set a resounding no to that. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, it's things like that and guys that are in you know, pre-med and, and Drew Tranquil who's mm. – engineer just just brilliance the combination of of academic excellence and football excellence is like uh you better be on your hands and knees thanking god every day because you've been given some gifts right. here. And, exactly. and, and, and exactly. they are i mean i you know i mean i could count on at 39 years i guess i'd need a few hands to count it all but very few negative interactions with with players sure. uh you know, head coaches you're going to butt heads with at times. Sure. Uh, you know, Brian Kelly, there, there's been a, a few instances, but he's he's fantastic. From our perspective, from a business relationship perspective, right. he was great. Holtz would – Holtz and I had – we had our fair share. I mean, you don't think don't think that he just limited it to you guys. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> uh, but he would – and 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 Brian Kelly's kind of like this too. When he when he when he jumps on you and knows that you've impacted that he's impacted you, right. you know, I kind of wear my emotions on my sleeve. So I'm sure I have a look on my face when I get attacked that sure. you know I look like a hurt puppy. <laughs> uh, and 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 BK always kind of comes back and and makes it better. Holtz would Holtz would do that. He would do that as well. Mm-hmm. But. Uh, <sighs> I, you know, I mean, I, 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 
I don't know that I, if I name one guy, I'm going to have to name a bunch, but I mean, sure. from your era, those were the guys that, uh, you know, Rick Meyer and I are, are very close. And behind me is, there's the cover, nice. of, there's the cover of him somewhere yeah. uh, behind me. But uh, yeah, and I cherish those relationships and my relationships are with you guys who are closer to me in age and we have so little access now. Right. Um, right. Here's a few guys. I, I do talk to Drew Tranquil. Okay. Harrison Smith is not only the best safety in football, but he's That's a salt of the earth and just an awesome guy. That's great. Um, I mean, I you know, Dalen Hayes now. He, I it, it's it's an unlimited. I, I could go back to before you, Reggie Ward mm-hmm. came in with Tim Brown. Wow. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Or around that time with Tim Brown, I, Reggie Ward and I got along great. That was like one of the first guys that I, you know, I was 23 or 24. Wow. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, just, and that, and I, and it's, I, it's one of the reasons I'm so proud of my alma mater because when, when you interview people, I say thousands, I don't mean thousands of Notre Dame football sure. players, but thousands of people in general. Sure. Uh, when you do this for 39 years, and you have a hard time thinking about a difficult interaction or uh, interaction with a with a football player after uh, with some of the things that I say and write. <laughs> I mean, God, you know, God bless them to, to be so to be so forgiving and kind. So, outside of the run that we had during the um, uh, late '80s, early '90s, I mean, do you remember a period or? What, what was one of your favorite periods? And it it doesn't have to be around kind of like a winning record, but what what, what year kind of made a difference or stood out for yeah. you? 93. I mean, oh, you know, okay. the, 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 the win over Florida State, which is pertinent again this week. And, sure. And the, the sheer agony. You know, look, I, I, I'm, when it comes to my work, I'm objective and it, it – if something needs to be said or stated, I, I say it. But sure. when Boston College beat Notre Dame in 93 after beating number one Florida State the week before, uh, I was uh, 33 years old then. I, I, that was a devastating, devastating loss. Um, you know, and, and, and like I said, from 88 through 93, Notre Dame football was, was uh, at, at the top of the chart. Right. And right. so to experience those things were great. And then, you know, I mean, then you had, you had a dry spell after, after Holtz left. And even at the end of the, the Holtz era where it started to slip a little, uh-huh. but, you know, Davey, Davey struggled. He had a couple of good years and struggled. Tyrone Willingham came in, had a really good first year. Right. Uh, and then struggled the next two. Um, you know, and so, and Weiss came in and his first two years were good and, and he just couldn't maintain it. So it, it's tough to, it's bad for business when you aren't competing <laughs> oh, for yeah. the titles. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, I mean, I thought Brian Kelly was the right guy for the job. Uh-huh. Um, Irish Illustrated broke that story two weeks. Oh, really? Before he was named. Yeah. Um, so we were on top of that, and it made it easy because I thought he was the right guy for the job anyway. And, sure, sure. And uh, fortunately, Notre Dame thought the same thing. I think he's done a really good job. You know how it is in Notre Dame, though. He's got to win a national title. Yeah, uh, that's 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 where, it, the, where the pressure comes. Right, and it's harder now than – it's harder Oh, my God. I can't even imagine. I mean, literally, if you're not in the top six, top eight, right. you might as well forget it. Well, and I always say this, I, the, the path of least resistance. If you are a four and a half to five star high school athlete and you can go anywhere in the country, are you going to choose Notre Dame, <laughs> which some do because they're, because they're sharp, you know, well-rounded people. Absolutely. But the path of least resistance does not go through Notre Dame. It does not. <laughs> I, I do have to agree with you. And, you know, I mean, Nick Saban's a genius and a mm-hmm. You know, he should. We say first ballot Hall of Fame. He should already be in it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, and he keeps it rolling. And Urban Meyer is in that class. And and uh, you know, but there there's a limited uh, group of schools that can do that. And where mm-hmm. Notre Dame is right now, I mean, like I said, thirty five and six. People always say to me, Chris, 
well, uh, Brian Kelly only wins the games that he should. And, and I get that because he has not been able to win big games. And in order to be a legend and to win national titles, you got to win big games. But I always say, and Eric Parsegian is right behind me there, <laughs> and he was he's a legendary figure. I was a, that was I was eight years old when I met him in his office. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, you wonder why I you wonder why I, <laughs> I do what I do. The, par the parish priest took my brother and me to meet Eric Parsegian in 1968. Oh my! Two God. years after they won the national title, I met. Joe Yanto and Tom Pagna, who, when I became an adult and covered Notre Dame football, I then interviewed them. Right. Yeah. The yeah. When they were, then that when they were coaches. Wow. But uh, my point about Eric Parsegian is, and he's a legend and a great coach, but he became a legend and a great coach by beating the teams that he should right. beat. He had, right. he had difficulty beating USC, mm -hmm. which everybody did at that time. Mm -hmm. He lost three years in a row to Purdue when Purdue was really good in the late 60s. But he beat just about every team that you thought he should beat. They didn't play, you know, they didn't play a real difficult. If you go back and look at the records of the opponents, then they didn't play a real difficult schedule. Okay. But he became a legend because he beat all the teams that he should beat. Right. And then beat Southern Cal in years that they won the national titles mm -hmm. and regained control over Purdue to a large extent and Michigan State and, and some others. But, uh, yeah, all Brian Kelly does is beat teams he should beat, uh, and he needs to beat you know, Clemson on November 7th. If he doesn't, yeah. the the crowd, and there is a very loud and vociferous crowd of Notre Dame fans that will never like Brian Kelly until he wins those games. And I get it. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of being a fan. That's what it's all about. But I'm here to tell you, and you know it, it is damn hard to win every time you play. And it's interesting because you think a game against Navy – I mean, we were supposed to blow them out, and I think we won by like a touchdown or two or something like that. You know, and so when you go back and and, and look at what those, I mean, competing, playing against the best of the best, and playing against their best. I mean, you know, everybody wants to beat Notre Dame, and but I I think the the challenge, especially now. I mean. We can talk about this a little bit, but I mean, do you think this this kind of foray into the ACC is going to lead into anything, or, or do you, do you think that they're going to kind of wash their hands after all this stuff is done? Because you got to, I mean, in, I mean, I'm not saying anything you already know, but they literally threw Notre Dame a lifeline. I think. Well, there's there's no doubt, and the reason they threw a lifeline was because they were already business partners in mm -hmm. in all sports, but hockey and football. When the pandemic broke and they were talking about having to change the schedule and conference only, a lot of people were telling us that, oh, well, the ACC is going to freeze them out. I, we knew they weren't going to freeze them out. They're business partners. Right. I mean, they they relate to each other all the time. Right. Now, if you would have told me that they were going to make N a Notre Dame a part of the ACC and they could play for the ACC championship, yeah, yeah. we literally laughed at that right. on a podcast when we first heard it. So Notre Dame needed the ACC, and the ACC – I mean, what what can you say? You've got to be thankful forever uh, for what they did. But uh, Notre Dame needed the ACC. The ACC needed Notre Dame too. They're sharing all the the uh, ACC network uh, revenue and the NBC mm -hmm. NBC, NBC money, revenue. right? Yeah. But do I think that Notre Dame is uh, if the world gets back to normal next year? Do I think Notre Dame is going to be in the ACC? No, I do not. But I do think that the relationship will will be strengthened. Sure. Maybe Notre Dame will make a greater commitment to playing more ACC teams than the five or six. Uh, maybe maybe like eight. You could play eight and still play USC, Stanford, Navy. I mean, those are your traditional rivals. And then uh, then a, a fourth non-ACC team would give you would give you twelve games. But I think that you know the relationship between Notre Dame and ACC is a very very strong bond. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jack Swarbrick is an amazing athletic administrator. Yeah, things that he accomplishes are just so off the chart amazing to right. me. Right. Uh, that that I, he is. Look, I've been around. I, I knew Moose Kraus. I was in his office with Colonel Stevens. Did you know 
Colonel I did not know Colonel Stevens, but I'm oh sure. my god, those those two were. I mean, that's like a, that was like a comedy act. Moose was the straight man. Wow. And Colonel Steven, but you know the name Colonel Steven. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I mean, I know from him, and I, you know, Dick Rosenthal. Uh, the reason that I wear a '88 national championship ring is because of my relationship with Dick Rosenthal, because. I was best man in his son's wedding when he was a freshman in Notre Dame. I was a senior in high school when I was best man in John Ro in Dick Rosenthal's son's wedding. Wow! And then all the, I mean, all the a a ads. I mean, I, I have had I have had a quality relationship with every one of those athletic directors, okay, uh, including Jack Swarbrick. Now I, I don't know that it was always rosy, but we we've come to have an understanding with sure. with each other, and and he's been fantastic to deal with. So. Um, but having said all that, nobody, nobody has accomplished what Jack Swarbrick has as mm -hmm. an athletic director. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, you know, if I'm the ACC, you know, my conversation with Jack would be, hey, we're, we're going to take care of you. And then hopefully you'll, you'll take care of us later. And I, I think that's kind of what you kind of alluded to. I think we are going to see more games. Right. And yeah. I, I think that if, I mean, you know, are we always going to play Navy? I mean, I don't know. I think they're still going to try. They're, they will always try because that was a Father Hesburgh decree. And, right. You know, I think that they will always try to do that. I, I agree with you. I think Notre Dame will do everything they can to show how grateful they are up to – Stopping right. short of right. becoming a full-time member in football. And I think that, and, and this is, I mean, this is, I mean, this is a conversation that I had for eons, right? I mean, at least in the last 39 years. Um, I mean, the idea of the importance of Notre Dame being independent. And I think that this showed us, this kind of pandemic thing really showed us like how far reaching um Notre Dame really is. I mean, when you think about the opportunity to play quality teams that are normally not in your schedule, I mean, who can do that? I mean, who first of all, who does that, right? So yeah. a lot of teams only see good opponents in a bowl game that are, that are not in their conference, right? Well, you know, Notre Dame sees them every other week. Right. And, you know, if, if, if scheduled properly – you know, you're going to have some really great games that are non-conference. I'm sorry, that are um, some games in the Big 12, some games in the SEC. Right. Well, when Notre Dame, teams can't do that. Chris, Notre Dame's schedule pre-pandemic was harder than the one they have now. Oh, exactly. Right, right. I mean, they, they right. were going to play Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, Stanford's down, but, I mean, I expect them to be better. I really thought that this was going to be a really good year for USC. Right. Now that they're going to play and coming out of this, I don't know all the dynamics of it, sure. but I, they had everybody coming back and they had a new defensive coordinator, which I thought was their biggest problem. And so, uh, and I, I, the, the, the previous schedule was a little bit more difficult than the one that they obtained by joining the ACC for right. this year. So, uh, you know, independence is important to Notre Dame. I know people on the outside, that aren't fans of Notre Dame can't understand that. They think it's unfair. And I and I get that. I mean, think about it. If you if you had an allegiance to somebody else, sure, right. And didn't like Notre Dame, you'd probably look at that and say, who the hell does Notre Dame think they are? Exactly. And I, and I get that. But it's important to them. It's still important to them. Um, I think Notre Dame will make additional concessions toward the ACC mm -hmm. to to prove how grateful they are. But you know, I, I don't know what gets Notre Dame into a conference other than the conference is just not playing ball with Notre Dame and not allowing them a path to the playoffs. Right, right. And that obviously won't happen. I mean, you have, every time they meet, it's the commissioners of all the conferences and Jack, right? I mean, so yeah. – and, and the idea – I mean, he taught me tons of stuff when I worked for him. I mean, it was just thinking out of the box. I mean – the idea yeah. that that you're able to kind of you're on this national stage well well let's do something that that makes us 
relevant, like, like makes us part of every conversation, which, oh, by the way, that's what that's what his job description is, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, promote, I mean, mean, make sure Notre Dame is where it's at and it stays where it's at. And, and, and it, you know, to get back to the, the, um, the, the conversation about independence, find me a team, if they had that chance, who wouldn't do that? I mean, please, yeah. right? I mean, if, and, if, you, if somebody else could get a contract come on. with NBC, come on, <laughs> come on. All right, so I mean, we. we I mean, maybe I, 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 you know, Alabama. I could be when you're when you're so ultra successful. Yeah, right. You know, you're a dynasty like that. Yeah, could could Ohio State probably, you know, but is it is that worth that to them in the long run? They only know Notre Dame only knows independence. Ohio State only knows conference play. Right. Right. Exactly. You know? so exactly. It's, it's, yay! I you know I want to. Why don't you, why don't you give some insight? You worked for Jack Swarber. Give some insight into him. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's what I was saying. I mean, he, he was he really thought out, out of the box, and, and you know, there were situations when we were looking for teams, and you know, he had no problem saying, you know, hey, call this school, call this school, and I'm like, well, you know, these are I mean, these are really good teams, you know, and, and I'm sure they're scheduled, and you know, I didn't understand the power of Notre Dame beyond kind of just saying, Hey, I'm a graduate. Hey, I'm a play. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't understand Notre Dame space in college administration. Right. I mean, I, I didn't realize that, you know, and, and obviously it's changed a little bit, but you know, there, there's, there's conference commissioner seats and Oh, by the way, there's Jack seat, you know? So, I mean, He's in those conversations, and 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 you thought that maybe the conferences might have looked down on Notre Dame, or because sure. they were independent. That's what right. that's what your thinking was. Right. right. It's it's pretty difficult to be in a to be at a, a a table of administrators and look down at Jack Swarbrick. I mean, you know, this is a guy he, he commands respect. Uh huh. But I but I also think that he. You know, I mean, I'm sure he's I'm, I'm I'm sure he's a tough negotiator with the ACC, but I just picture that he gets along with those guys. Oh, absolutely, and that, and that and that's no small feat when you're you're the interloper in football. You know, right. getting into first of all, getting into the Big East was totally necessary with all the other sports, but right. then to get them in the ACC, the best basketball conference, generally speaking, not right. last year men's basketball, definitely not last year, but generally speaking, um, you know, to get them in that conference, I, I, when I heard that what the deal was to get into the ACC with all sports 2014, I think uh -huh. when, when it was announced, when I heard that my, my, my jaw just dropped. I couldn't believe the negotiating skills to get them in that situation, which is exactly where they wanted to be. People always said, well, maybe they should go to the Big Ten. No, the big markets are along the East Coast. Jack knew that all along. You right. know that working right. with him. You, you, I mean, that's where the markets are. That's where you want to be. That's where you want to recruit while still being Notre Dame and going to California and Texas and wherever you have to go. But ACC was where Notre Dame always wanted. Really, really, when it came down to it, the major markets, that's where they wanted to be. And who pulled it off? Jack Swarbrick. Right, you know, and kind of going along with that, I mean, and the, the athletic directors understood what it meant to to bring Notre Dame to a Wake Forest, um, but the coaches didn't. And so there was a lot of flack. I mean, the, 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 the coaches in the ACC were pissed. And a, a lot of them because part of the agreement, and you probably know this way, way more better than I do, but – how do, there's can you explain the bowl agreement that Notre Dame has with the ACC? So it's like they can go when it's not for national championship or second or something like that. Can you? Yeah, I, I I don't know that I can speak for it word for word uh, breakdown. It's been a little bit problematic. Uh, you know, last year they went to the Camping World Bowl and people were looking for ways for them to get to the Orange Bowl. Right. Right. And it, it, it didn't work out. Uh, there's a Notre Dame grad that's the, the head of the Orange Bowl 
that would love, you know, would have loved to have had Notre Dame last year. And it right. was a worthy 10 and two Notre Dame team, but it just, it just didn't work out uh, by the, the nature of the rules of who goes where. Right Now in this agreement, you know, if Notre Dame is excluded, if Notre Dame misses out on the playoffs, but they're still 10 and one, let's say they miss out on the playoffs, they're 10 and one, right. which, which I doubt, but depending upon, <clears throat> depending upon how that works out, that could happen. This year, they can go to the Orange Bowl. Oh, right. You're right. Exactly. exactly. So, you know, again, and I, I, I know there are a lot of people out there that don't quite have the same viewpoint that we have of Jack Swarbrick, so we should probably end the love fest here for him. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not, it's respect. It's respect sure. right, right. Exactly. for exactly. the man and the, the athletic administrator that he is because right. – He's really, really good, and that includes the ability to play in the in the damn Orange Bowl this year, which they couldn't do last year, right? Even if they were to fall short of a, of a fourteen playoff scenario, right? And so let's talk a little bit about before. And this is kind of going a little bit longer than I anticipated. But when you have great conversation with a great guy, that's what happens. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what what you're thinking of what you think about the Big Ten and the Pac-12 kind of coming in late. Um, outside of the reasons why, but I mean, what do you think as far as the scheduling goes? What do you think the the, the, the college football playoff um, uh, committee's thinking? Yeah, it's certainly not ideal. I mean, it creates a whole bunch of problems. Right. How do you? I mean, it, it truly is an apples and oranges comparison because of the the despair. First of all, the disparity in number of games that will be played. Sure. Having said that. I'm glad they're playing because that's in the, in the grand scheme in the long range of football, it's better that they play. Right. We, exactly. We, exactly. We, we need that. You need, you need Ohio state. You need Michigan. You need Wisconsin. You need Penn state. Oregon was going to be really good this year. I keep saying was, I know they're going to play, but I don't know how, you know, throwing everything off kilter will impact the way they were going to play. Right. Uh, but we, you know, we need those schools. We need the big 10 and pac 12 playing. So they've got the Rose bowl. Um, you know, ha but having said that, it's going to be a mess at the end of the year. There's going to be a ton of controversy. Uh, the inequality and in the number of games will, that will be played will create a lot of furor. Fans will be in an uproar. Um, Notre Dame could possibly be hurt in a playoff situation if, if, uh, I don't know exactly what the schedule is, but if you have two Big Ten teams that are undefeated, I, I don't know sure. who plays whom exactly. Uh, and Notre Dame's 10 and one and there, how many games are big 10 playing? Uh, I think eight. eight I want to say yeah, that the not, championship might be nine. So, right. So, I mean, controversy, controversy is coming. There's no way of avoiding that unless you excluded those two conferences from the scenario, the, the playoff scenario. And I don't think that's a, that's not in the best interest of college football. It, it's a, it's the craziest year we've ever experienced. Hopefully we never experience anything like this. So you're just going to right. have to live with it. Right. And if people want to say, oh, there's an asterisk next to the name of the national champ, whatever, so be it. But I do think this, whoever wins the national championship, particular, particularly if it comes from the SEC Big 12, which it won't, or ACC, uh, you navigated one of the most incredibly right. difficult situations right that you could throw at a school slash football program. Sure. Unbelievable. Sure. I mean, what, sure. what Notre Dame, just Notre Dame alone, having, having been around it and studied it and, and, and dealt with Brian Kelly and, and Jack Swarbrick. I mean, I talked to Jack Swarbrick the day after they determined that they were going to close the school down. So, I mean, we've been in, you know, wow. I mean, from the very beginning and, it, and it's all, every conversation you have is surreal. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you win the national title, and you and you come out of this, and you navigated all the issues that you had to deal with. You deserve that national title, man. Right. It's, it's, hey. it's funny because when people start talking about asterisks, I'm like, no way, because this by far is the hardest anybody had to compete. I don't care if it's Big Ten, Big Twelve. I mean, when when you look at what was thrown at them, and this is all teams. I mean, being able to literally, as we're seeing, make it from week to week. And maybe even practicing. I mean, how does it seem? I mean, I know these coaches are going nuts because, as you mentioned, I don't know if you are a control freak, but coaches are control freaks. Absolutely. And if you take 
10 minutes off of a practice, they're furious, let alone a day or two or three. Are you kidding me? I, I, I have a saying that I use, and I probably stole it from somebody. But w with regard to leadership, there are things that you can control, and there are things that are just out of your control. But you're in charge, and so you're responsible for it. Sure. When you are a leader of any organization, you've got you better control the controllables. Right. Which is why what Father Jenkins did, and this is this is the, the, no politics involved here. But when you go to the Rose Garden and you don't wear a mask after you've admonished your student body for te having so many positive tests at the start of school, right. this isn't political. It's right. it's about being the leader in the face of the university in Notre Dame right. and the impact by going to the Rose Garden and not wearing a mask and then getting sick and the reaction of the student body. Right. Okay. Right. I'm going to say for the third or fourth time, this is not political. No, no I totally, totally it's understand. About, totally it's understand. About, well, I want everybody to understand that. <laughs> um, that was a controllable, controllable, right. which he didn't, which he didn't do. Right. So now my point is, Imagine Brian Kelly and all these head coaches, how many things have been out of their control. And you're right. You have to be a control freak as a coach. That's what you, if you don't, if you're not, you lose. Right. Right. But there are only so many controllables in this football season. That's very true. So I want to end it on a kind of a positive, a, a different note. Um, the, when I mentioned before that we kind of shared some things um, over the years, um, I like to, I'm, I'm a huge dog lover, and when we we're kind of talking um, off camera, you mentioned that you're um, you guys had to put down um, a dog that you've had for a while. Uh, can you kind of share share the story there? Because <laughs> yeah, you know, I love dogs, man. I mean, yeah, it's awful. The sweetest, the sweet. <laughs> The sweetest boy in the world, as we said. I mean, yeah, we had to put him down uh, 13 days ago. And anybody that's a dog uh, owner understands what that's all about. He was 15. His back his back legs didn't work anymore. Mm. Uh, we adopted him when he was – he was running the neighborhood, and he just showed up like he showed up like, don't you love me? And we did. <laughs> and we ended up – we found who the owner was. Um, okay. And he had other dogs, and I don't know how it worked out, but he just kind of let us adopt him. Uh, wow! And and he was awesome, but uh, you know, you know what that's like. I thought you were going to bring up the conversation about our mothers, actually. Well, well, that that too, but I don't, I don't want to jump into that because okay. I mean, I don't know how you feel well, feel about it. Yeah. So, uh, so Lori and I are sad. We're 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 sad. It's been a sad thirteen days, and and uh, there's a picture of him then, and I. You know, I'm here by myself most of the time. I've worked out my home for 15 years. And so hopefully there are no uh, recording instruments in my house because they hear me talking to a picture of him. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Last, you know, I, I, I feel the same way. And, and, and I shared with you that um, I've had dogs. And, you know, it, it's something about, you know, a living being understanding your emotions and you could have the worst day. And I, I've had a bunch worst day imaginable. And you got, and I, I, we have cats. Um, however, I, I married into cats. I didn't, I didn't own them first, but I married into cats. Um, and, and cats are cool, but th there's something about a dog and, and, and that look in their eye when you come home. Right. I mean, or or when they come up from a nap or you take them out and literally their goal in life, I think, is to make you happy. And they sit there and they sometimes they do some of the stupidest shit. I mean, I have one who I adopted her when she was like seven weeks old. Um, she had some medical issues. She chewed up several leather couches that I spent a lot of money on. And I did not murder her. I blamed it on the couches. I mean, he forgave so her, he forgave her every time, right? Every time, man. And then, and then, you know, he even bought her ice cream or something. You know? I mean, just <laughs> it, the idea that there's somebody that, or, I'm sorry, there's something that really kind of understands the emotion. Um, and, and I really do think that, that they do. 
But more importantly, you know, it's funny because there's a, a saying that when people, you know, adopt a dog, like, hey, we found a dog that really helped us out. Oftentimes people say that dog found them. Right. right. You know, and, and it, it's just well, that, that, that feel, pardon me? That's exactly what happened. This dog found us. Absolutely. See, you Literally. know, and, and for me, um, I was fortunate to have a dog after my mom passed away. And after I went through a bad divorce, my dogs were there. And, you know, it's just one of those things. It was like, you think people would kind of laugh at you talking about picture. I've had hour long conversations with my guys. I mean, with, with these dogs, right? Because they won't respond, but I know they're listening. I totally know they understand. And so, you know, for me, it's just, it's great. And so when you mentioned that, I mean, I, I just want to acknowledge, you know, for, 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 for all, of us, all of us dog lovers out there that, you know, we're, there's a special place in heaven for dogs because they literally will do what they can to make you happy. So when you treat them right, when you treat them right. Yeah. Yeah. No and doubt. since you brought it up, talk about our moms for a little bit. Um, we have a very unique, yeah, a, a shared experience here that I guess some people might consider it a little bit morbid, but it, it's, it's, it's life and it's a reality. And like you, I would not have wanted it any other way. Um, yeah. what, what we're talking about is unfortunately um, kind of being there when we discover that our moms have passed away. And for me, you know, it's, it's been in the media for, for years. Um, came back from the Orange Bowl and I actually spoke to her um, the, after we won, um, spoke to her a couple hours after that. And then when I re returned home, um, you know, I broke down our door and I found my mom had passed away. But, um, Tim, please tell us, unfortunately, what, what kind of happened. In this situation. Yeah, it's a similar situation, but, uh, you know, I was 49 years old. I wasn't 20, 23 like you, which sure. had to be really, really hard, but similar situation. And, you know, my brother, we hadn't heard from her, and uh, I didn't have to break the door down because she had gotten in the door um, and um, had a stroke. And, uh, yeah, but there is mm -hmm. something, there is, uh, and, again, I don't want to be morbid, but there is something comforting about, it's kind of like a full circle thing. Sure. sure. And I don't really know that I can explain it any more than that, other than, um, I, you know, I, I don't really know what to say, but it is, it is a shared experience between you and I, which we already had a, a, a great friendship through the years, but um, you know, that's a unmistakable bond, I guess, yeah. when we both yeah. experienced that. Yeah. Dude, this is this is kind of a great way to end it, man. I mean, this is this is great, you know. And when, when I originally talked to you, I was like, "Hey, man, we're gonna be on for an hour. Don't worry about it." And as you can see, we we kind of exceeded that hour. But that happens when you know we we're just flowing. And I mean, there's some things on here that we didn't get to, but the idea that I've learned so much more about you than I, I knew before is encouraging for me because I think of you now as kind of as a, as a closer friend, but you know, this, this is what we, we try and do on my podcast. When I, I tell guys we want to get away from the X's and O's and really kind of talk about like how you got there. I mean, you know, what was your idea? And, and then one of the questions I ask guys who, who recruited, but you literally already answered everything was, you know, why Notre Dame? how did you get there? But you know, when, when you grew up there and, and you've kind of explained kind of how how much Notre Dame means and meant to you as a kid, and then you had a chance to actually wear that Notre Dame across your chest, I don't have to ask you that question, which I think is kind of organic, yeah. and, I, and I like it like that. It's the only place I wanted to be, and um, my son, who is infinitely more intelligent than me, he only applied to one school, wow. and, it, and, it, and it was Notre Dame, and he's a, he's a double graduate, and that you know, as probably as much as you pat yourself on the back for getting a degree when your child gets a degree, <laughs> it's it's really, really, really special. Um, and so I'm proud. I'm proud of Notre Dame. I'm proud to be a small part of it. I realize that other than being a graduate, I'm still the outsider looking in when it comes to <laughs> Notre Dame football. I did want to remind you. Can um, okay? Let me get this straight. See this back here, Chris. 
You Which one, the Ohio State one or the one next to it? The one next oh. to it. I'm pointing to it. It's okay. A, oh, do you know what that is? I do not. It's it looks a, like a program. Well, it's a flip chart, which is what the media gets for every game. Okay. Uh, well, we used to anyway. Uh, <laughs> that was 39 years ago. Well, in pandemic, too, they aren't handing stuff out. <laughs> but, uh, turned down. but that's a flip card, and that's what that that is the uh, flip card with the depth charts from the Fiesta Bowl, Notre Dame versus West wow. Virginia. So that's wow. Uh, that's see, 30, it, it, it's kind of cool stuff like that, you know that that means like. If somebody had that, it probably doesn't mean jack to them, but it means something to you because you used it, you know, because yeah, you, know, and you these, experienced it. And these, uh, I don't know which way to go. These are press passes. Nice. From the, through the years. And there's some other, there's some other ones. And then what, what's the one next to Holtz? That looks like an audit. Is that just like a piece of paper? Other side. Yeah. What is that? A, oh, like man. A that's right. here. That's like a 1924. That's like a four horseman, uh, a, a smaller version of the flip card. It's no it's, way. Yeah, it's a depth chart from 24. I I would have Jesus. to turn around and check, but I'm pretty sure that that's what it is. I'm trying to get out of the way to show you my. Oh, look at that! The Sports Illustrated cover. Sports Illustrated covers down there. Nice. So uh, I really, I am not a. You know, when you're a member of the media, I don't own, I don't wear anything Notre Dame. I, I, I never go to Notre Dame wearing something. Sure. If I do have anything, uh, you know, Notre Dame, I don't, I don't wear that on my sleeve because I take being an objective member of the media sure. seriously. Sure. Uh, but this is my little tiny office, and I don't hold. And back. why not? I don't hold back in in this one. You, why? Why not? I mean, this is your domain. This is what this is. This is what you care about. It's, it's who, it, Yeah, it's it. Uh, it it's my life. It is. It's who I am. It's a big part of who I am. Tim, this was awesome, man. Let me uh, just kind of do a couple things. Um, thank you for everyone watching on Facebook Live. Um, within the hour, uh, you can check out my YouTube page at Chris Zorich 50 and you'll get this whole interview. You'll have a chance to rewatch it and laugh and um, make fun of us because we kind of went a little bit longer than we were supposed to. Um, I would I almost, like I almost, to, I almost reached bull car level. <laughs> I don't think anybody can reach bull car level. I think that was like a that was two hour plus. So that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> and most of all, my uh, my I want to thank my wife who was my producer and who kind of taught me all this stuff. And um, Tim, I know you've been doing this for a while, but I have not, and so I've kind of had to learn all this stuff on the fly. And I have no freaking idea what I'm doing sometimes, but you are, I'm trying. You are, you're, the, the key to it is being a good conversationalist, and we have had a, I think, a very good conversation. I had a great conversation. I am, uh, I am unapologetic in saying um, that I love you, man. You're the, you're the best. I always exactly. have and have a great deal of respect for you. I had a great deal of respect for you when you got into Notre Dame and uh, everything that you've accomplished. I love you. You're the best, man. I, I do appreciate that. See, and this this means a lot because, like, I mean, you saw me grow, right? And and I'm, I'm not going to get emotional. I'm going to fucking get teary eyed or something like that. But I mean, there were. I mean, I I remember going in there, not knowing what what's going to happen. I remember going in there, leaving my mom, leaving my neighborhood, leaving my school. I mean, I don't know. And. You know, you got you were there, and, and and I almost look at you as almost like a, a teammate, right? Because we've had those conversations. We've I've seen you, you know, for for for, for at least for me for 30, 20, 30 years. I mean, the the idea that I mean, literally, I've known you for more than half my life. I mean, that that's that that's like I can only I share that with my really good teammates. And my best friends, right? I mean, I, I don't, I don't spend this much time hanging out with people I don't like, <laughs> and being part of the no, 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 but being part of the media that can either go, you know, one of two ways. I mean, they, they can go either way, and either you have a bad relationship, or let's say if you did print something that I didn't like, which I'm sure you did. I mean, I'm man enough. Or I would hope I would be man enough to come up to you and say, you know, hey, what do you think behind that? 
And you explain, so, okay, well, hey, that's your opinion, and that's fine. And so although I respect members of the media, there aren't a lot that I'm willing to kind of hang out with and kind of share, you know, uh, a, a, a beer with and really kind of hang out like 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 you were a teammate. I mean, that, that's special to me. So I do want to thank you, man. I love you well, too, bro. I, I appreciate that's that. A, it. That means the world to me, and it's a, it's, it's a privilege to be your friend, Chris. I appreciate it. I do appreciate that, man. So again, um, I want to thank my wife, wonderful producer. Uh, I already told you guys about the YouTube page. We're, we're going to do something really cool here. I have a graphic. Oh, I got to find it. Um, you and I are, are going to be done, Tim, but if you can just let the I, – I have credits. There's like three credits, but okay. yeah, it, it, it's something. But, Tim, I had a great time, and I love you, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks, brother. Take you care. Got it.